It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Hannah Sieber, who's the co-founder and CEO, COO of EcoFlow, a uh, path-breaking, pioneering, portable power electronics uh, storage, uh, electricity storage uh, company. Uh, Hannah uh, is actually currently also, uh, besides being C CEO, CEO of her company uh, in the MBA program at Stanford Business School. In fact, uh, one of the people who told her told us he might be a even better speaker than he was uh, for the last energy seminar uh, last quarter. Vivas Kumar strongly recommended her, along with uh, a huge group of uh, GSB students. She also, uh, with uh, from my eIper uh, hat point of view, is a, uh, a rising star in the uh, Emmet Interdisciplinary Program at Environmental Resources Joint Program uh, MS student in uh, uh, in eIper. She's also a graduate of uh, Duke University in International Comparative Studies, where she was an honor student and I think won a, a big uh, a title for the best project in her uh, school and actually gave a commencement address I saw online also speaks Chinese, so she seems uh, well qualified, if not overqualified, to talk to us today about entrepreneurship and energy, building a battery company from Shenzhen to San Francisco. Hannah, take it away. Great, thank you so much for that uh, kind intro. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today. I know it's uh, late on a Monday and uh, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So I appreciate uh, everyone and seeing so many names logged in. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about building EcoFlow, the battery company I co-founded in 2016 um, from a warehouse and from an apartment in Shenzhen uh, all the way now to where we have offices in both US and in Shenzhen. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technical side, about uh, the trends in the industry um, and then as well about the personal side of, of building EcoFlow and some of the lessons I've learned. Um, so uh, to start off, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, thanks to that warm introduction, you already know a lot, but I graduated from Duke um, where I got my BA and then I'm right now an MS MBA candidate here at Stanford. Um, in 2016, I was living in Shenzhen, China, and I was working with a few other uh, friends of mine who were at DJI, the largest consumer drone company. Um, and at the time, the drone market was about $6 billion market, growing at 58% annually. So it was one of the biggest markets on the way to exploding. Um, and we would watch drone pilots. They would go into the field every single day with either their car, a generator, um, or extra batteries. And all of this was incredibly inefficient. And as we looked around, we realized it wasn't just drone pilots that were using batteries. Or sorry, it wasn't just drone pilots that were using generators. We also saw um, campers here in California. We saw uh, different uh, teachers all across the developing world. We saw all sorts of people using generators to power their life. And so we started to look and we realized that there was a huge market opportunity to displace the fuel generator market. And so here's the market for portable power about how we think about it. So on the smallest side, you have your power banks. Those are generally uh, four cell battery management, four cell systems. They might have uh, USB ports, type C ports. Um, you use them to charge your phone, maybe to charge your laptop. And then on the bigger end, you're gonna have um, home power walls. So that's obviously the Tesla power wall, uh, Sonnen in Europe, um, and getting into an industrial storage. But there really wasn't any in the middle space. And that's partly because uh, the, technolog the technical capability you need to build in this middle space most people were going after the electric vehicle market, which is a much bigger market. Um, and so we started to realize there was a huge gap um, here in the middle. And so we created EcoFlow to disrupt uh, the portable power space and to create a, a greener and safer alternative to fuel generators. Um, so here's our product. This is River. This is the very first product we ever launched. Um, and so just to give you an idea, um, it's about 11 pounds, the size of a toaster. Uh, it's the lightest at its capacity, so it's two-thirds the weight of anything else on the market at its capacity. Um, all the ports you can imagine, so there's USB-C, Type-C, DC, AC ports, 12V car charger, real-time screen telling you the power draw, um, and then it's also thermal managed, so it can go from negative four degrees if you're ice fishing um, to 140 degrees if you're in the desert um, or at a music festival, say. Um, so, Today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about building EcoFlow. 
The last thing I'll say is that EcoFlow is a growing company um, and we have a lot of proprietary information. So I'm sharing a lot of high level thoughts today. Um, if something I say feels simplistic or you wanna dive into it more, just follow up with me offline. Um, I will share my contact information at the end of this. Um, so here are the, first we're gonna talk about the industry drivers and particularly in 2016, how the market was shifting under our feet. Um, and what made the business really viable, both the tailwinds that helped us and the headwinds that slowed us down. Then I'll move on to building EcoFlow, um, talking about some of the lessons I've learned, um, both the good and the bad. Uh, and then finally, there'll be time for Q&A at the end. Um, and I know that um, they're aggregating questions. So if you have questions, you can post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So as I was reflecting on what's been happening in the portable power space and why we've succeeded at EcoFlow, it really came down to these three areas. What's been happening in production, which is declining costs of both solar and storage. What's been happening on the usage side with the growth of portable residential usage. And what's been happening on the demand side as increasing demand has led to really interesting supply chain complexities. So this is probably familiar news to many people on this call, but lithium ion battery packs have decreased in price significantly in the last decade, been almost a 90% decrease, which is roughly 16% year over year compounded annual growth rate in just the last five years. A lithium, these, in this bar chart, if we were to double click, you would see that about 70% of the cost is attributed to lithium ion cells, while the other 30% is contributed to the battery pack. Within a lithium ion cell, you know, the three main minerals, you have nickel, cobalt, and lithium, all of which have declined um, substantially and all of which are expected to continue declining. Um, sometimes I get questions that are asked, what happens if we were to run out um, of cobalt? Even if prices go up for some of these downstream minerals, there will be, uh, the sensitivity with lithium ion is so small that the prices will not, will be very minimally affected. Um, so kind of the takeaway here is this benefits the entire industry. You know, this is part of the reason we've seen a proliferation of all sorts of lithium ion devices, your watch, your computer, and much larger uh, devices such as e-scooters and electric vehicles. Um, but what this also means is that it created, it changed the industry and created a world in which smaller companies can now get in. So it's allowed startups and companies that, per, that formerly didn't have the access to capital or the ability to play in a, in a high stakes market like this to now be able to enter the battery market and to create, and you can see that if you look at the growth of startups particularly in Shenzhen, which is where we were, which is where 90% of the world's electronics are manufactured. Um, so this has just allowed an enormous amount of startups. And for us, it allowed us to go into the white space of that portable power, half a kilowatt hour and up market that none of the big players were tackling. And the trend here is that this is expected to continue to grow and the industry continues to bet on lithium ion. So you can see here that it's uh, decreasing along an exponential curve um, there's about an 18% learning rate. That means that for every time supply doubles, um, there will be about an 18% decrease in, in the price. Um, and you know, something I always laugh about is the current prices are, are heavily dependent on a lot of the big players that can uh, negotiate huge volume discounts. Um, so it's still, you know, it still costs more for a startup and for a company like us to, to get into the space than some of these rates you may see. Um, but overall, there's been such big investment, over $2 trillion of investment into the space that I would say lithium ion is here to stay. People often ask me, you know, what do I think the future is? How long will lithium ion be around? And I think there is um, really, I'm really optimistic about the future of both solid state, of flexible batteries, um, of all sorts of technologies. However, the amount of investment that's come from both the storage and electric vehicle companies means that there's a lot of people who have a lot at stake um, to continue li with lithium ion. And so I think for the next at least five, if not 10 years, um, this is what we're likely to see. Um, and so what this means is that, you know, the lithium demand has just, has grown significantly. Um, and when we think about lithium demand, most people think about electric vehicles. And I think that makes sense. They're the largest portion of this um, with over 38% of the market by 2025. But what most people don't realize is that storage is also a huge part. And in fact, storage is growing at an even larger and quicker rate than electric vehicles. 
So in the last 10 years, from 2015 to 2025, energy storage has grown at about 46% compounded annually. Um, and just in the last five years, it's been about 14%. So what that means is actually the more exponential growth is yet to come. Now we play in a very small percentage of this storage. So what you can see on this chart is that the storage includes other things like grid management, load shifting, reserve power. Um, so the portable power space that we play in is only a fraction, but it gives me a ton of optimism um, that energy storage is the future. And when I think about what I expect the future to look like, I imagine every single home will have the ability to both generate and capture um, and store their own electricity. And hopefully, and we'll talk about this when I get to the future a bit more, but hopefully be able to buy and sell and share that with neighbors um, in some type of microgrid community. So now we're gonna turn to the solar side. Um, I wanna talk briefly about solar, even though it's not what we do explicitly at EcoFlow, but because in order to com uh, effectively compete with fuel generators, we need to have both solar and storage. And so, the picture for solar looks fairly similar. There's been huge uh, cost reductions in the last five years, um, almost 20%. Um, and some of those cost reductions have come from increases in inverter efficiency, um, higher module efficiency, and better technology overall in the solar space. Um, it, they've also come from the solar tax credit. So many people are probably familiar with the ITC, um, which reduces the solar system cost from a, uh, by about 26%. Um, I think the question there, right, is that the, we're starting to run out. What is the future going to look like? Um, and the future is slightly less certain. However, I am very optimistic that solar will continue to grow. Um, you can see this year we passed 2 million residential installations. Um, that's truly incredible. To put that in perspective, that's more, electric, that's more solar installations than electric vehicles we have on the road. Um, so that really excites me in terms of and understanding that both together with solar and storage, we can effectively displace um, traditional sources and particularly uh, have a portable option to, to displace the fuel generator. Um, so that's a little bit on the production and on the cost side. Um, and the biggest thing is that it's allowed small players like EcoFlow to enter the market um, and to address you know, needs that are not currently being served. So now if we turn a bit to the port portable residential use, um, here I want to talk about, again, the portable side. So a lot of the information that's out there is about uh, residential home installations uh, and just broader residential use. Um, and here I want to imagine thinking about instead of having a generator, what would it look like to have a portable battery that you have around the house? Um, so the biggest reason that's driving this is the unfortunate uh, growth in natural disasters. So this is one of my favorite charts um, and it, because of what it shows, not because of the reality. Um, and it, this is the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters from 2017. And so you can see uh, there were a bunch of hurricanes. Um, you can see some tornadoes in the Midwest. Um, in California, you see wildfires. That was the year we had the 2017 Cubs fire here in Santa Rosa, which was uh, the most significant loss from any wildfire ever in history at that point. And then in 2018, we see a similar picture with slightly fewer events, but actually in aggregate, uh, more loss. Um, so again, we see hailstorms now, we have hurricanes, lightning, and again, we have wildfires. And that year, we had the campfire here in California, which then surpassed the Cubs fire as the deadliest fire in terms of damage. And then finally in 2019, you can see it, it looks very similar. Um, and 2019 was actually a slightly smaller year in terms of loss, um, but overall, you know, again, a ton of growth of natural disasters. And so looking at this from a numbers perspective, this is a chart that shows loss events in the US. So this is just a total aggregate number of events. And you can see in the US, we've hovered just above or below about 100 events for the last three years. And that's about an eighth of what we see globally. So there's been over 800 events globally with a total loss of 150 billion uh, globally in just 2019. Um, and this chart breaks it down. So you'll be able to see hydrological events, geophysical events, um, meteorological events. Um, but the kind of broad takeaway is they're almost all climate related events. 
Um, so this is expected to continue and continue to get worse. Um, and what's what I look at this is that, you know, from an insurance perspective, only a third of this loss is covered. So what that means is that homeowners are more and more focused on preparedness and what they can do to be prepared should anything go wrong. Um, like many homeowners won't get the money that back that they deserve or that they need. Um, and so the views towards self-reliance um, have shifted and we've actually seen this even continue to grow now um, with everything happening with COVID-19, um, which is unfortunate, but with everyone at home, kind of that focus on being self-reliant uh, and prepared continues. Um, so in addition to that preparedness mindset, um, there's a few other reasons that portable power is taking off in a residential setting. Um, in terms of home backup, lithium ion is now the, the, the clear front winner. Um, so many of you might know of lead acid batteries. This was the precursor to lithium ion. Um, and lithium ion offers several strengths over lead acid. Um, so from uh, efficiency, the lead acid is 30% efficiency, while most lithium ion is over 90%. And if you take the same capacity lead acid battery and lithium ion battery, the lithium ion will charge about five times as quickly. So there's a lot of just plain, in addition to weight um, and other features, there's a lot of advantages to lithium ion. When you compare lithium ion to a generator, there's also quite a few advantages. Uh, so some of them, you know, are kind of obvious. You know, they're quieter, which means that you can do a lot more um, around the house, you can run it inside. That's a big deal so that because you don't need to run fuel, being able to have a product or a battery with you indoors. Um, and most people don't realize this, but generators have killed roughly 70 people each year just in the US, uh, which makes it one of the deadliest consumer products. Um, and so when we think about, you know, kind of going after the market, um, we, you know, the, the generator market continues to grow. You can see on the right side, um, it's projected to grow at about 9%, um, or it's been growing at roughly 9% and projected to continue growing at about 9%. Um, and part of that's because of the utilities. Um, utilities are actually incentivized to suggest generators. So even here in California with all the planned power outages, utilities will suggest people have generators on hand um, because it won't take away ultimate revenue from the utility and it's a lot less threatening than having um, you know, solar and storage on hand. And so, I hope that you know we can make a dent in these numbers and that next time I'm showing this graph, um, we have slightly less than 9% uh, forecasted growth. Uh, but that's, you know, right now, and that's kind of generators are a big part of the market here. Um, so just kind of recap, the increase in natural disasters and the quality of lithium ion has led to like a strong preparedness mindset um, where homeowners are keeping batteries on hand. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the demand side um, and the why some why some of the supply chain complexities have come from demand. Um, so the lithium ion market is a very complex market. Um, you know, lithium ion mining is distributed across the world, um, predominantly in Chile, uh, in South America, but also in Australia. The two biggest cell manufacturers are, are both laid, uh, both located in Asia. And then 90% of the world are like manufactured in Shenzhen. And so while this is not uncommon for similar to the auto industry, you know, kind of having a dispersed and complicated supply chain, um, it has meant that it makes it much harder for smaller companies to get going, having the ability to co-locate uh, manufacturing and production, having the ability to design on site. Um, those are all things, you know, having the ability to build a new uh, factory if, if you know, you can't have capacity quickly enough are all the advantages that bigger companies have. And part of the reason we um, at EcoFlow have taken a two-pronged strategy. So we have a team in Shenzhen um, on the ground and we actually have a team that's partly in our factory there. And then we have a team in the US and that's allowed us to at least bridge some of the, uh, some of the cross seas and some of the bifurcation. Um, you know, this is something that I think about a lot um, from just supply chain dislocation lead times are very long. It can take about 12 to 18 months to source components in this industry. Um, you know, for the longest time, there was less supply of lithium than there was demand that has now shifted. Uh, however, that means that if you're a small player like us, being able to vertically integrate, um, being able to work with suppliers directly, um, and being able to, to buy at volume have all been really helpful tactics. 
um, as we think about uh, how to grow. Great, um, so that will kind of wraps up some of the technical side um, from a global supply chain perspective, just the complex planning, the forecasting and the flexibility are all challenges to small companies. And obviously there's a huge inventory risk anytime you're sitting on boat, whether it be components that you can't manufacture, um, finished products you can't sell, um, all of that is a huge threat to just our financial viability and our cash flow. And so um, while these first two are more headwinds, the, you know, both the, excuse me, the first two are more tailwinds, both the costs and the increase in, in residential preparedness, this one has been more of a tailwind. That's, this, this one has been more of a headwind that's been uh, challenging us as we move forward. That's great. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, building EcoFlow. Um, so here are some just quick facts about EcoFlow. Um, we were founded in 2016. Um, I founded it with three others. There was Bruce, Eli, and Frank. All three of them were at DJI, the consumer drone company. Um, we have global teams, both Shenzhen and San Francisco. Um, and we've raised just over 10 million in VC capital. Um, so we are a VC-backed startup. Uh, so this was, I showed this graph earlier to kind of talk about the market we play in. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the actual products that we have in this market. And so starting um, on that first slide, you'll see River Mini. So River Mini is the first stackable battery ever. Um, we're really excited about it from a technological and engineering point of view. Um, and the reason we built it is actually um, because of some of the challenges around large scale lithium ion. So anything over 100 watt hours is fully regulated, which means you can't fly with it. It means that there's special taxes associated with it. It means shipping it is very challenging. If you've ever gotten those boxes that have the big, uh, the big diamond on it that says hazmat dangerous good, that's because it has over 100 watt hours of capacity. And so River Mini was our way to get around that. It's, an, it's a product that people could fly with um, it's a product that if you could take each segment alone has 100 watt hours and then you can clip them together to have more and more capacity. Um, and so we did that through pogo pins and through it has wireless charging on the top and other opportunities or other ways in which we've technologically engineered it um, to be both uh, applicable to the standards and also great for our customers. The middle product is River and um, that's the product I, I opened with and talked a little bit more about. Um, it's a half a kilowatt hour of energy um, and really great for your kind of home devices that are not heat generating. Um, so we have a lot of people who will use that um, if they go into the field to take with their drones. Um, we have a lot of people that use it for home backup power to have their lights or fans or routers going. And also people that use it for medical reasons. So if you have a nebulizer or a CPAP, or if you want to use it as a UPS, an uninterrupted power supply during the night, um, that's another great opportunity for River. And then finally, our third product, um, which I don't have a picture of here, but if you go to our website, you'll see it. Um, we just launched, it's called Delta. And Delta is a 1.3 kilowatt hour product um, that is truly a replacement to a fuel generator. Um, so the best selling generator is the Honda 2000. Um, and our goal is to continue to build upward until we've, we have a product on the market that's both superior in terms of product and price. Um, and so just here's a recap. We went over this a little before, but um, it's about a 2 billion market here in the US um, and about 20 billion globally. Um, so fuel generators continue to grow um, and they're loud. They're not good for the environment. They require maintenance, they require fuel uh, and they're dangerous. And so there's many reasons in which, you know, we'd like to see a cleaner, greener, safer world um, with fewer generators. And here's just a few pictures of some of our different use cases. Um, so we have a, a strong professional use case. Um, so as part of that's construction, you can see in the top uh, picture there in the top row, um, lithium ion cordless tools have been growing. And so more and we work with more and more home contractors. Another professional use case is film and photography. We work with uh, people like the Weather Channel, National Geographic, anyone that's doing aerial droning. Um, and that needs uh, a high power battery and lights, or high power to camera and lights for their products. Um, we have a big recreational use. So that's anything from camping to music um, to now work from home. I get a lot of people who tell us that, you know, they're so grateful to have this. 
with everything happening from work from home. They can, you know, work outside on their patio. They can um, make sure all the kids' devices are charged. Um, they can take it with them in the car on road trips. Um, that's been a big one. And then our third one is home use. And by home use, I really mean home backup power. So for any of those natural disasters we talked about earlier, being able to know kind of you can have some semblance of life right away and to keep things going. So as I thought about this presentation and kind of the audience, I thought maybe it would be helpful um, to just talk to you a little bit about um, some of the lessons I've learned um, and kind of what's gone right and what's gone wrong um, at EcoFlow. So my first lesson is just that need statements change. Um, and I think this sounds quite intuitive, but it was really hard when we were starting out. So we built EcoFlow specifically for drone pilots. It was a product that we thought, you know, would, would take off in the droning industry. And soon it became clear that actually home backup power is a much, much bigger industry. And so here are the photos. This was actually after Hurricane Maria in 2017. We went down and we donated units to both hospitals, homes, a couple of schools in Puerto Rico. Um, and you can see up top, we have uh, Lula and her husband using it for their oxygen um, in his bed. And then on the right hand side, there was Maria using it for her lights and her fan. Um, and these were, this was a time when, you know, the power was completely ravaged um, from the country and from the island for, um, for months on end. Um, and so for us, realizing that, you know, home backup power was a much bigger need. Um, and that's, it was interesting because people don't always buy for what they need for. We still have a lot of people who buy it for um, all sorts of different use cases, but this has definitely been the, the number one use case that we've seen. Um, and so how did we learn this? Um, so it started by, we did a pre-order campaign. So we uh, launched a, a Indiegogo campaign in spring of 2017, uh, and we sold over 2,000 units. We raised over a million dollars um, we completely blew away our expectations. And what was so great and why I urge anyone that's ever looking to do something to start with a pre-order campaign is it's such a low risk way to get to talk to customers. You know, we built a community of people that were really excited about our product um, and that shared some of their passions and interests with us. So people that were like, I want to use this for my Blackberry camera um, so that I can take pictures all night long. Um, we had people that said, you know, I'm so excited. I just want to have this so that you know, everything could be organized around the house. And so you started to learn kind of where people were coming from. Um, and through this, we learned, we did a lot of digital marketing and a lot of face segmentation through our Facebook and, and other online advertising. Um, and we quickly learned that there was a strong kind of preparedness focus and need. And so then on the right-hand side, you see our team. This is us kind of getting all the boxes uh, ready. Um, and I share this simply because people often ask me, you know, what does my job look like? What do I do? Uh, and every day, of course, is really different, but a lot of those early days, um, I spent, you know, shipping at the warehouse, talking to customers, doing everything I could to make sure that I really understood and had the most customer empathy possible, um, and I could build the best product for our customers. And so I share this because I just want to say you have to follow your needs and your need statements for business survival. Um, backup power in the U.S. is a nice to have, um, but not always a need to have. Um, I'd love to spend 100% of our time focused on the developing world and focused on the places that need us most, but it's also important to understand um, where we can sell and, and what people need and, and who needs the product. So my second lesson here um, is just talking a little bit about our fundraising process. Um, so we went out to raise $5 million for our Series A, um, and it had been just after that crowdfunding campaign um, you know, we had raised over a million dollars, we had sold on cloud nine, um, and we had demonstrated huge success in, in terms of product interest and, and some level of beginnings of product market fit. Um, and as it turns out, 2017 was a really hard year for hardware. Um, you know, I wish I'd seen this graph at the time and knew that that was going to be the case. Uh, but, you know, we started raising our Series A, we pitched over 20 VCs. And almost every VC asked us if we had thought about building an app for both data collection and for recurring revenue. Um, and this is widely, this is not something spread across energy and, or this is an issue that's widely spread across hardware and energy simply because the returns are not optimized on a VC horizon. Um, that same year in 2017, uh, we'd seen Juicero, uh, you know, kind of have a huge hit or scandal. We saw Jawbone go out of business. 
Um, and so we've just seen, you know, a ton of, a ton of a negative kind of pressure and look at the, the consumer hardware space. Um, so we went out and I asked customers about adding apps, about adding Wi-Fi, um, and you know, only one group thought it was useful. First responders came back and shared that, yes, they would love an app. They thought it would be great. Then they'd be able to go into the field and they would know, be able to maybe be pinged when their devices were fully charged. But almost everyone else was kind of neutral. Um, and ultimately, you know, as a startup, you have to prioritize your energy and your resources. Um, and we didn't have the resources at the time to build toward making an app. Um, it would have it would have changed the, our ability to work on other products. And so yeah, I share this just to say you should stay true to your product needs and requirements, um, and you should change your product needs for customers, um, but don't necessarily change them for VCs. I think that there's um, you know a lot of great opportunities um, to build the best product, but also part of strategy is figuring out what not to do. Um, so this is lesson three, and this is a little bit about building innovative products and building a new market. Um, so on the left, you can see that was an end cap. So that's kind of the merchandising display at a Home Depot. Um, and we really didn't know where to merchandise. Were we an electronic? Were we a generator? Did we go in the home section? You know, where did we go? And people look at your product and they don't really know what it is. Um, on the flip side, up top, you'll see this is an image from our HSN, so our home shopping network uh, uh, debut we did uh, not long ago. And you'll see Home Shopping Network, which is a TV retail network for people who don't know, um, was a really interesting opportunity for us to um, display multiple scenes, um, to talk about the product, talk about the interface, the ports, how you use it, why you use it. Um, and this was a huge lesson to us that when you build new innovative products, it often means you have to build a new market. Um, and that takes a lot of time because products don't sell themselves. And I think we had always thought and hoped, you know, this is the best product on the market. This is the most innovative product. People are gonna want it. Um, when in fact, there was a lot of consumer explaining and consumer awareness that we had to do um, in order to orient people to the market and orient people um, to our product. Uh, so lesson four, um, this is just a lesson on the fact that um, if you want to build best in class products and if you want to tackle something hard, um, it takes a long time. And this has, you know, hindered us sometimes in launching EcoFlow to do things slowly um, and to do things the right way. You can see, you know, here's our product compared to a few other options on the market, um, Anchor, and then also Goal Zero. And you can see that we surpass them in many ways, whether it be in the number of the output ports, um, the weight capacity ratio, the ability to recharge quickly. Um, battery life and cycles is a really important one and just recognizing that we can hold charge for a year, whereas most of our competitors hold charge for about a third to a half of that time, um, which means they're not nearly as effective if you wanna have, a, have the product around for preparedness, if you wanna be able to keep it in the closet, um, should you have power go out unexpectedly. Likewise, we have flow through charging um, and we're solar powered and, and solar enabled. And so, you know, some of this talks about thinking about, especially in the energy space, if you want to build a great product, um, it's not just a quick, you know, this has been a four year journey um, and we're only just beginning. Um, and it's been really incredible uh, to start to find product market fit and start to understand um, what customers want, what customers need, um, and how we can deliver that. Uh, so now I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot of things on my mind as I think ahead um, and a lot of things that excite me about the future of this industry. Um, so just from the lithium ion perspective, there's gonna, we're going to see a lot of really great um, product changes. Um, and this is industry wide, not just at EcoFoam. So these are things like energy, growth and energy, better energy density, uh, longer cycle life. So cycle life, meaning if you can recharge it 500 times, you can recharge it 100 times. Think about on your iPhone. Um, when you all of a sudden the battery in the top goes to orange and it only charges to 80%, that's because you've hit your cycle life. Um, and then lower costs, which I shared at the beginning, are really going to enable um, batteries to start to be um, an equalizer. You know, to me, so much of this comes back to when I was in college, I'd spent time in Nicaragua volunteering, and every single night the power, you know, we the sun went down around 6:30 and we had no power, no solar. And I started to see how much, how much energy is an axiom for equality. It's the way in which we do our work, the way in which we go to school, it's the way in which we go about our lives. We cook, we eat, we clean. 
and all of that and being able to create products um, across the globe and particularly what excites me um, are the areas where um, there's not a developed grid infrastructure and they have so much potential to almost leapfrog the grid. Um, and that leads into that second part, which is the half-life of batteries. Um, just being able to, something people don't realize is so a lot of times once you've gone through that first battery um, cycle, you're still able to use the battery. It just may not charge as efficiently. Now that's a problem if you're in life-threatening life or in like critical applications. But for things like energy storage, there's a huge potential um, to reuse batteries um, from their half-life, allowing them to essentially have already eaten up maybe 50, 80% of the cost in the first, in the first product, um, such that you could offer them to uh, at a much, much reduced price for, for a second go. Um, and then the third thing that really excites me is the ability to you know, export power back onto the grid. I think we're already starting to see this and it, it's an exciting time, certainly in the residential and solar space, um, but buying and selling among neighbors, I see a world in which you could have, you know, collectively your own storage in a microgrid system and where you're able to share that with neighbors, maybe even bringing in the blockchain as you think about what it would look like to trade distributed energy. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and just say thank you guys um, for tuning in today um, and for joining on the end of your Monday. Um, and my email is there for anyone who wants to get in touch. Thank you. I would say, uh, Hannah, thank you very much. That was a very uh, concise, uh, comprehensive, and inspiring talk, uh, for sure. Uh, to it, we actually got quite a few uh, interesting questions. So I'll try to, to not make you give away uh, inside secrets from your business strategy, which several people want to know about. So let me start with a more techie one, and that is, are you considering or do you want to hear about uh, battery technologies that go even beyond uh, lithium ion at this point? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we're always thinking about that. Um, we're really excited about what's happening in phase change material and just some of the ways in which we could, um, you know, bring better products. Um, I think at this point, you know, our, our R&D pipeline really is focused on lithium ion, certainly for the next 18 months to three years. Um, but I'm always following the trends, and, and I do believe we'll see a step function growth um, into new technology sometime in the next five to eight years. Great. Uh, next one is uh, on the back end. Uh, have you uh, planned for um, using uh, your uh, products when the uh, battery cells degrade uh, and or recycling them at this point? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so it's, we manufacture, uh, like I said, in China, and you actually can't um, import batteries back into China. So everything that we export, we have to recycle. Um, we go to great lengths to make sure we're doing that in the most sustainable way. We work with um, R Squared and our, our third partners here um, in the US, certainly for all the batteries here. And so recycling is really important. Um, and then like, I think kind of to the second part of that question from a refurbishment point of view, um, we do believe a lot in, you know, the ability to refurbish and reuse. Um, like I said, you know, we don't have a product on the market right now, but something we're really excited about is just the half-life of batteries um, and the future potential that would give us to, uh, to innovate and create even more products. Um, so that's something definitely uh, on our minds. Just to generalize in part the first part of your uh, last response, uh, what uh, important differences have you observed in the customer markets in the U.S. and China, and uh, also doing business, which you already did touch out uh, in the two uh, marketplaces. And finally, uh, just to pile on a little bit, uh, how do you select the sequence of markets that you target uh, in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, we started by launching our Kickstarter, our Indiegogo campaign, which was a global campaign. So we had people from over 30 different countries buy um, our products right off the bat. Those countries were predominantly in Europe, uh, North America, and then throughout Asia. Um, we launched in the U.S. Um, partly because that was just my, you know, I'm American. I'm an American citizen. My co-founders are Chinese citizens. Partly it was, that was kind of the market we knew best. Uh, but we um, have quickly moved. So we sell right now, you know, in the EU, um, in Japan, in China, uh, and we're starting to expand just beyond that. Um, I think for us, prioritizing markets has just been about taking our time, focusing, you know, when we do a market, we want to do it right. 
Um, so that means that we put a lot of both time, money, and resources behind it. Um, so it's kind of been slow and steady. I will say that, um, you know, it's been really interesting watching how world disasters have affected. So two of the largest global disasters in 2019 were the typhoons in Japan. And that we've actually seen has also shifted a, a really strong Japanese mindset towards preparedness. Um, and since then, there's been a lot more uptake there. Um, so some of it's also been watching globally what's happening and, and adapting our strategy as needed. So then we have a set of questions regarding uh, how long you uh, can uh, uh, use the, uh, let's make it more specific. So if there was a disaster, how long does the initial charge device uh, get you? And is there a plan for what would happen for a long term, say Puerto Rico scenario where you would need to get more? Obviously, you, if the sun's out, you could, you could do solar jet and so on. So what's your, uh, overall game plan uh, in that uh, uh, situation? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, you know, they hold charge for a year. So that means if you were to put it in your closet on January 1st, you could expect to still have a charge uh, a year later on December 31st, December 30th, excuse me. Um, from a perspective, you know, long-term, you know, these aren't batteries that are meant to keep your entire house running forever. Um, these are portable. And so you would need to recharge it um, with solar, um, we have, you can also recharge it via the wall, so you can plug it into the grid, or you could recharge it via your car through 12 volt car charging. Um, and then everything we do is flow through charging, so you can use the product while it's charging, um, meaning that there's not an elapsed wait time. Um, so so but, uh, uh, that's a great general answer. On the more specific thing, if you get knocked out by a storm, how long can you go on the initial charge that you start with at that point? Yeah, so it depends, of course, on what, what products you're using. Um, you know, you could charge your computer a half dozen times. You could keep your phone charged for 30 nights. Um, you could charge a CPAP through two nights. Uh, you know, it really depends on, on just the energy draw and, and the products you're using. So another one, uh, this may be too close to uh, confidential. Uh, the, the, the general version of this question is, uh, what's your strongest competitive strategy? And uh, someone knows about a company called Go Zero which it is uh, alleged is a potential competitor for Delta. Yeah, so, so I am no Goal Zero quite well. Um, they were actually bought by Energy uh, about six years ago now. Um, you know, they're doing really great stuff in the space. We watch them all the time. Um, you know, our, our products we feel are superior um, for many reasons, but I'm, we'll probably take that one offline. Great, great. Uh, uh, let's see, there's a couple of questions on um, the um, um, home, home em uh, emergency backup power. So I guess a, a easy, easier one to answer is, how much do you think it is natural disasters versus, well, climate-induced, weather-induced natural disasters versus COVID? Is COVID adding a lot more interest, a little bit about the same to what you've got as you presented the last two or three years of natural disasters? Yes, so, so I think it certainly is natural disasters because this trend has been around for a while. Um, I do think COVID has made people a little bit more focused on the uncertainties in life and the fact that maybe some of the assumptions um, that we've all taken for granted can sometimes be uprooted. Um, and so with that, I do think that, that in some ways COVID has made people focus a little bit more on what they can do themselves um, to, to kind of be in control and to, to understand um, and to just be prepared. Um, but I, you know, I think there is a strong baseline just towards COVID has not made the power go out, for example, for many people. And so, you know, I do think there, there's still a strong uh, natural disaster uh, symptom here too. Yeah, back, back to the app part of this, this actually, uh, cycles back to some of the previous questions. I know you didn't want to uh, muck around too much. It's kind of like the the um, the Apple Watch with all the health apps. I know they wanted to get the product out first, and now they're adding onto it. So the quite there is a, a a group actually even at Stanford that has kind kind of optimal power management, designing a device uh, in an integrated way that uh, takes into account the um, use of power during the different cycles and how many you have, uh, how, how much power you have left and how you could optimally uh, allocate to say the different uses that you have going on at any one time. Any uh, interest in, 
and that uh, we obviously have a lot of app people around Silicon Valley, as you know. Yeah, so certainly, and and I I think we, we definitely will start to um, or there's likely to be an app in the future. Um, it was it was more a kind of a focus and prioritization, and I think the way you said it was great was like getting the product out was our number one priority. Um, but I think there's a lot that can come from remote access of being able to see, you know, the power draw, what products you're using, how much energy, imagine a world where you could also then start to tell, like, is my refrigerator leaking? Um, what's happening? You know, what does a usual power draw looks like? What does it look like today? Um, so there's a lot of monitoring, um, as well as just ease of use that could come from an app. Great. There's another hit on uh, uh, China. So what are the biggest challenges in the China market versus the U.S. market? Um, yeah, I mean, so for us, the, I mean, the China market has has been quite strong and continues to be. Um, you know, I think that there's some differences around um, just kind of disposable income and, and kind of awareness. You know, most people in China are living in apartment buildings, which in some ways um, is great for us. They, you know, they can't run a generator anyways, um, but it in some ways means that there's maybe less of a mindset towards kind of preparedness. Uh, and certainly, you know, in the China market, um, we have a lot more kind of copycats and a lot more people competing with us um, at a, a different level or different scale. Um, so that's the other thing to keep in mind. Uh, another one by a uh, very uh, famous uh, faculty member is, uh, how do you think about the cost competition between just using batteries and using your device? Yeah, so, you know, our device, we, we sell River right now for 499, so it's about 500 US. Um, it's certainly more expensive than if you were to go buy just the regular batteries. Um, however, um, the, the kind of ability to continually use it, um, the ability to use it in, in across a range, a wide range of temperatures, um, so in the kind of freezing cold to the very hot, um, we surpass a lot of what you can do with batteries um, from that perspective. Um, additionally, just the kind of multiple ports. And so when, I, when we think about that, um, you know, I think that there's just a lot of value add that we add in our products. Uh, the next one maybe is a semi-obvious one. Have you thought about scaling up the size yet again and perhaps hitting a larger scale uh, kind of uh, business market as opposed to uh, households? Yeah, so we will definitely be getting bigger. I can't share what is coming next, but um, we are definitely moving bigger and um, that is the future for sure. Uh, I guess I have one uh, final question on my own account, which several people hinted at. Uh, uh, for someone like you, I always like to know what's next for you? What are your longer term career goals to the extent you can pick your head up? Maybe during COVID, you could actually not be traveling around as much and think through that. Because I, I think you're going to be a pretty big role model for a lot of the young students here. What do you, how do you see your career unfolding? What would you like to do and how would you like to do it? Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, so, you know, I'm very proud of everything we've done at EcoFlow and, and want to continue to see that through. I think that it's just the beginning of, of a long journey. I think personally, I love building things. Um, I love building products. I love building companies and plan to continue to do that. Um, for me, I have a strong focus on, on helping others and things I can do to make the world better, as cliche as that sounds. Um, so, you know, focused on what we can do, things that we're in right, right now, whether it be in the supply chain, um, whether it be in manufacturing, logistics, I like a lot of these kind of, um, you know, more more physical, tangible industries. Um, and I think a lot of them are rife for, for really great innovation. Well, uh, Hannah, thanks a lot for a great talk, which obviously inspired a lot. We had 21 questions, which is able to only part, partially summarize. And in particular for that last answer, I'm sure we'll all be uh, watching for what you do next. Thanks again. We very much appreciate it.